Section 12 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 12, Isabel. Dirk and the lady entered the room he had just quitted. He set a chair for her near the window and waited for her to speak, but kept his eyes the while on her shrouded figure. "'You are well disguised,' said Dirk at last, as she made no sign of speaking. "'What is your business with me?' He began to think that she could not be Jacobia, since she gave no indication of revealing herself. Also, he fancied that she was too short. "'Is there any one to overhear us or interrupt?' the lady spoke at last, her voice muffled a little by the mask. "'None,' answered Dirk impatiently. "'I beg that you tell me who you are.' "'Certes, that can wait.' Her eyes sparkled through their holes, in contrast with the ghastly painted wood that made her face immovable. "'But I will tell you who you are, sir.' "'You know?' said Dirk coldly. The student named Dirk Renswode, who was driven forth from Baal University for practicing the black arts. For the first time in his life Dirk was taken aback, and hopelessly disconcerted. He had not believed it possible for any to discover the past life of the learned Dr. Constantine. He went red and white, and could say nothing in either defense or denial. It was only about three months ago, continued the lady, and both students and many other in the town of Baal would still know you, Sir Tays. A rush of anger against his unknown accuser nerved Dirk. By what means have you discovered this? he demanded. Baal is far enough from Frankfurt, I wot, and how many know? And what is the price of your silence, dame? The lady lifted her head. I like you, she said quietly. You take it well. No one knows save I. I have made cautious inquiries about you, and pieced together your story with my own wit. My story, flashed Dirk. Certes, ye know naught of me beyond Baal. No, she assented, but it is enough. Joris of Thuringa died. Ah, ejaculated Dirk. The lady sat very still, observing him. "'So I hold your life, sir,' she said. Dirk, goaded, turned on her impetuously. "'Ye are Jacobia of Martzburg.' "'No,' she started at the name, "'but I know her. "'She told you this tale?' Again the lady answered, "'No.' "'She is from Baal,' cried Dirk. "'Believe me,' replied the stranger earnestly. She knows nothing of you. I alone in Frankfurt hold your secret, and I can help you to keep it. It were easy to spread a report of Dirk Renswood's death. Dirk bit his finger, his lip, glared out at the profusion of roses, at the darkening sky, then at the quiet figure in the hideous speckled mask. If she chose to speak, he would have, at the best of it, to fly Frankfurt, and that did not suit his schemes. "'Another youth lives here,' said the lady. "'I think he also fled from Baal.' Dirk's face grew pale and cunning. He was quick to see that she did not know Thierry was compromised. "'He was here. Now he has gone to court. He was at Baal, but innocent. He came with me out of friendship. He is silly and fond.' I have to do with you, answered the lady. Ye have a great and terrible skill. Evil spirits league with you. Your spells killed a man. She stopped. Poor fool, said Dirk somberly. The stranger rose. Her calm and self-possession had suddenly given way to fierce, only half-repressed passion. She clasped her hands and trembled as she stood. Well, she cried thickly, you could do that again, a softer, more subtle way? For you? he whispered. For me, she answered, and sank into the window seat, pulling at her gloves mechanically. I cannot help you if you tell me nothing, said Dirk at length in a grim manner. 
I will tell you this, answered she passionately. There is a man I hate, a man in my way. I do not talk wildly. That man must go, and if you will be the means, you will be in my power, as I am now in yours, thought Dirk, completing the broken sentence. The lady looked out at the roses. I cannot convey to you what nights of horror and days of bitterness, what resolutions formed and resolutions broken, what hate and what love have gone to form the impulse that brought me here to-day. Nor does it concern ye. Certes, enough, I am resolved, and if your spells can aid me, she turned her head sharply, I will pay you very well. You have told me nothing, repeated Dirk, and though I can discover what you are and who is your enemy, it were better that you told me with your own lips. She seemed now in an ill-concealed agitation. Not to-day will I speak. I will come again. I know this place. While, certes, your secret is safe with me, think over what I have said. She rose as if to take a hasty departure, but Dirk was in her way. Nay, he said firmly, at least show your face. How shall I know you again? And what confidence have you in me if you will not take off your mask? I say you shall. She trembled between a sigh and a laugh. Perhaps my face is not worth gazing at, she answered on a breath. I wot ye are a fair woman, replied Dirk, who heard the consciousness of it in her alluring voice. Still she hesitated. Know ye many about the court? she asked. Nay, I have not concerned myself with the court. Well then, and since I must trust you, and like you, her voice rose and fell. Look at me, and remember me. She loosened her cloak flung back the hood, and quickly unfastened the mask, snatched it off. The disguise flung aside, she was revealed to the shoulders, clearly in the warm twilight. Dirk's first impression was that this was beauty that swept from his mind all other beauty he had ever beheld. His second, that it was the same face he and Thierry had seen in the mirror. "'You do not know me?' she asked. "'No,' answered Dirk. "'He could not tell her that he had seen her before in his devil's mirror. "'But you will recognize me again.' "'Dirk laughed quietly. "'You were not made to be forgotten. "'Strange, with such a face, ye should have need of witchcraft.' "'The lady replaced the mottled mask, "'and looked the more horrible after that glimpse of gleaming beauty.' and drew her mantle over her shoulders. Dirk pro-offered no question, made no comment, but preceded her down the dark passage and opened the door. She passed out. Her footstep was light on the path. Dirk watched her walk rapidly down the street, then closed the door and bolted it. After a pause of breathless confusion and heart-heating excitement, he ran to the back of the house and out into the garden. It was just light enough for the huge, dusky roses to be visible as they nodded on their trailing bushes. Dirk ran between them until he reached a gaunt stone statue half concealed by laurels. In front of this were flags irregularly placed. In the center of one was an iron ring. Dirk, pulling at this, disclosed a trap-door that opened at his effort and revealed a flight of steps. He descended from the soft, pure evening air and the red roses into the witch's kitchen, closing the stone above him. The underground chamber was large and lit by lamps hanging from the roof, revealing smooth stone walls and damp floor. In one side a gaping blackness showed where a passage twisted to the outer air. On another was a huge alchemist's fireplace. Before this sat the witch. About her a quantity of glass vessels, retorts, and pots of various shapes. Either side of this fireplace hung a human body, black and withered. 
swinging from rusted ropes and crowned with wreaths of green and purple blotched leaves on a table set against the wall was a brass head that glimmered in the feeble light dirk crossed the floor with his youthful step and touched natalie on the shoulder one came to see me he said breathlessly a marvellous lady i know murmured the witch and was it to play into thy hands she threatened me he said and for a moment i was afraid for certes i do not wish to leave frankfort but she wished me to serve her which i will do for a price who is she blinked the witch that i am come to discover frowned dirk and who is it she spoke of also somewhat of jacobia of martzburg he coughed for the foul atmosphere had entered his nostrils give me the globe the witch handed him a ball of a dark, muddy color, which he placed on the floor, flinging himself beside it. Natalie drew a pentagon round the globe and pronounced some words in a low tone. A slight tremor shook the ground, though it was solid earth they stood on, and the globe turned a pale, luminous blue tint. Dirk pushed back the damp hair from his eyes, and resting his face in his hands, his elbows on the ground, stared into the depths of the crystal, the color of which brightened until it glowed a ball of azure fire. "'Show me something of the lady who came here today,' commanded Dirk. They waited. "'Do you see anything?' breathed the witch. "'Yea, very faintly.' He gazed for a while in silence. "'I see a man,' he said at last. The spells are wrong. I see nothing of the lady. Watch, though, cried the witch. What is he like? I cannot see distinctly. He is on horseback. He wears armor. Now I can see his face. He is young, dark. He has black hair. Do ye know him? Nay, I have never seen him before. Dirk did not lift his eyes from the globe. He is evidently a knight. He is magnificent, but cold. Ah! His exclamation was at the change in the ball. Slowly it faded into a faint blue, then became again dark and muddy. He flung it angrily out of the pentagon. What has that told me? he cried. What is this man? Question Zerdouche, said the witch, pointing to the brass head. Maybe he will speak tonight. She flung a handful of spices on to the slow burning fire, and a faint smoke rose, filling the chamber. Dirk crossed to the brass head and surveyed it with eager, hollow eyes. The dead men dance, smiled the witch. Certes, he will speak tonight. Dirk turned his wild gaze to where the corpses hung. Their shriveled limbs twisted and jerked at the end of their chain, and the horrid, lurid color of their poisonous wreaths gleamed through the smoke and shook with the nodding of their faceless heads. Zerdouche, Zerdouche, murmured Dirk, in the name of Satan, his legions, speak to thy servant. Show or tell him something of the woman who came here today on an evil errand. A heavy stillness fell with the ending of the words. The smoke became thick and dense, then suddenly cleared. At that instant the lamps were extinguished and the fire fell into ashes. Something comes, whispered the witch. Through the dark could be heard the dance of the dead men and the grind of their bones against the ropes. Dirk stood motionless, his straining eyes fixed before him. Presently a pale light spread over the end of the chamber, and in it appeared the figure of a young knight. His black hair fell from under his helmet. His face was composed and somewhat haughty, his dark eyes fearless and cold. "'Tis he I saw in the crystal,' cried Dirk, and as he spoke the light and the figure disappeared. Dirk beat his breast. "'Sir Douche, ye mock me!' 
I asked ye of this woman, I know not the man. The brass head suddenly glowed out of the darkness, as if a light shone behind it. The lids twitched, opened, and a glittering red eyeballs stared at Dirk, who shouted in triumph. He fell on his knees. A year ago today I saw a woman in the mirror. Today she came to me. Who is she? Sherdouche, her name. The brass lips moved and spoke. Isabeau. Who was the knight ye have shown me? he cried. Her husband, answered the head. Who is the man she seeks my aid to, to, who is it of whom she spoke to me? The flaming eyeballs rolled. Her husband. Who is she? The Empress of the West, said the brass head. A cry broke from Dirk and the witch. Dirk shrieked another question. She wishes to put another in the Emperor's place. Yea. The light was growing fainter. The eyelids flickered over the red eyes. Whom? cried Dirk. Faint yet distinct came the answer. The Lord of Ursula of Rousselary, Balthasar of Cotreg. The lids fell and the jaws clicked. The light sank into nothingness and the lamps sprang again into dismal flame that disclosed the black bodies of the dead men hanging slackly with their wreaths touching their chests, the witch crouching by the hearth, and in the center of the floor stood Dirk smiling horribly. End of section 12. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 13 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 Chapter 13 The Snaring of Jacobia The great forest was so silent, so lonely. The aisles of a vast church could have been no more sanctified by holy stillness. Even the summer wind that trembled in the upper boughs of the huge trees had not penetrated their thick branches and intertwined leaves, so that the grass and flowers were standing erect untroubled by a breath of air, and the sun that dazzled without on the town of Frankfurt did not touch the glowing green gloom of the forest. Seated low on the grass by a wayside shrine that held a little figure of the Madonna, Natalie the witch, hunched together in a brown cloak, looked keenly into the depths of cool shade between the tree trunks. She was watching the distant figure of a lady tremble into sight among the leaves of the undergrowth. A lady who walked hesitatingly and fearfully. As she drew near, the witch could see that the long yellow dress she held up was torn and soiled, and that her hair hung disarranged on her shoulders. Breathing in a quick, fatigued manner, she came towards the shrine. But seeing the witch, she stopped abruptly, and her grey eyes darkened with apprehension. "'What is amiss with Jacobia of Martzburg? asked the witch, in her expressionless way, "'that she walks the forest disarrayed and alone?' "'I am lost,' answered Jacobia, shrinking. "'How do you know me?' "'By your face,' said Natalie. "'How is it you are lost?' "'Will you tell me the way to Frankfurt?' asked Jacobia wearily. "'I have walked since noon. "'I was accompanying the Empress from the tournament.' and my horse broke away with me. I slipped from the saddle. Now I have lost him. Natalie smiled faintly. Let me tell your fortune, said the witch, slowly rising. You have a curious fortune, and I will reveal it without gold or silver. No, Jacobia's voice was agitated. I have no credence in those things. I will pay you to show me the way out of the forest. But the witch had crossed softly to her side, and to her manifest shrinking terror caught hold of her hand. "'What do you imagine you hold in your palm?' she smiled. Jacobia endeavoured to draw her hand away. The near presence of the woman quickened her unnamed terror. 
lands and castles said the witch while her fingers tightened on the striving wrist gold and loneliness you know me answered jacobia in anger there is no magic in this let me go the witch dropped the lady's hand and smoothed her own together i do not need the lines in your palm to tell me your fortune she said sharply i know more of you than you would care to hear jacobia of martzburg the lady turned away and stepped quickly but aimlessly down the shaded glade natalie dragging her brown cloak came lightly after you cannot escape she said you may walk in and out of the trees until you die of weariness yet never find your way to frankfurt who are you cried the lady with a touch of desperation in her faint voice and what do you want with me the witch licked her pale lips come with me and i will show you to what end should i go with you exclaimed jacobia i know you not and god help me i mistrust you the witch shot a scornful glance over the lady's tall figure supple with the strength of youth what evil could i do you she asked jacobia considered her intently indeed she was small seemed frail also jacobia's white fingers could have crushed the life out of her lean throat still she was reluctant to what end she repeated natalie did not answer but turned into a grass-grown path that twisted through the trees and jacobia afraid of the loneliness followed her slowly as they went through the forest the green still forest with no flower to vary the clinging creepers and great blossomless plants with no sound of bird or insect to mingle with their light tread and the sweep of their garments on the ground jacobia was aware that her senses were being dulled and drugged with the silence and the strangeness she felt no longer afraid or curious after a while they came upon a pool lying in a hollow and grown about with thick dark ferns the sunless waters were black and dull on the surface of them floated some dead leaves and the vivid unwholesome green of a tangled weed a young man in plain dark dress was seated on the opposite bank on his knees was an open book and his long straight hair hung either side of his face and brushed the yellow page behind him stood the shattered trunk of a blasted tree grown with fan-shaped fungi of brilliant scarlet and blotched purple and orange that glowed gorgeously in the universal cold soft greenness oh me murmured jacobia the young man lifted his eyes from the book and looked at her across the black water jacobia would have fled would have flung herself into the forest with no thought but that of escape from those eyes gazing at her over the pages of that ancient volume but the witch's loathsome little hands closed on hers with a marvellous strength and drew her shuddering round the edge of the pond the youth shut the book stretched his slender limbs and half turning on his side lay and watched jacobia's noble and lovely figure clothed in a thick soft velvet of a luminous yellow hue her blonde hair straying on her shoulders and mingling with the glowing tint of her gown her grave and sweet face lit and guarded by gray eyes soft and frightened made a fair picture against the somber background of the dark wood a picture marred only by the insignificant and drab-colored figure of the little witch who held her hand and dragged her through the dank grass do you remember me asked the youth jacobia turned her head away let go of her natalie continued the youth impatiently he rested his elbow on the closed book and propped his chin on his hand his eyes rested eagerly and admiringly on the lady's shuddering fairness she will run said natalie but she loosened her hold jacobia did not stir she shook the hand that natalie had held and caressed it with the other 
the young man put back his heavy hair do you know me she slowly turned her face pearl pale above the glowing color of her dress yes you came to my castle for shelter once dirk did not lower his intense ardent gaze well how did i reward your courtesy i told you something she would not answer i told you something repeated dirk and you have not forgotten it let me go she said i do not know who you are nor what you mean let me go she turned as if to move away but sank instead on to one of the moss-covered boulders that edged the pond and clasped her fingers over the shining locks straying across her bosom you have never been the same since that time you sheltered me said dirk she stiffened with dread and pride ye are some evil thing she said her glance was fierce for the passive witch why was i brought here because it was my wish answered dirk gravely your horse does not often carry you away jacobia of martzburg and leave you in a trackless forest the lady started at his knowledge that also was my will said dirk your will she echoed dirk smiled with an ugly show of his teeth belike the horse was bewitched have ye not heard such a thing santa maria she cried you have given a youth i know a post at court he said why jacobia shivered and could not move she looked drearily at the black water and the damp masses of fern then with a slow horror at the figure of the young man seated under the blasted tree i do not know she answered weakly i never disliked him as ye did me added dirk maybe i had no cause to love you she returned goaded why did you ever come to my castle why did i ever see you she put her cold hand over her eyes no matter for that mocked dirk so ye liked my comrade thierry she answered as if forced against her will well enough i liked him was he not pleasured to encounter me again and since he was doing not i but why do you question me can it be that you are jealous the young man pulled his heavy brows together am i a silly maid to be jealous meddle not with things ye cannot measure it had been better for you had you never seen my comrade's fair face ay and for me also and he frowned surely he is free to do as he may list returned jacobia if he choose to come to court if ye choose to tempt him answered dirk but enough of that he rose and leant against the tree above his slender shoulder rose the jagged tongue of grey wood and the smooth colour of the clustering fungi and beyond that the forest sank into immense depths of still gloom jacobia strove desperately with her dull dread and terror but it seemed to her as if a sickly vapour was rising from the black pool that chilled her to horror she could not escape dirk's steady eyes that were like bright stones in his smooth face come here he said jacobia made no movement to obey until the witch clutched her arm then she shook off the clinging fingers and approached the spot where dirk waited i think you have bewitched me she said drearily not i another has done that he answered certes ye are slow in mating jacobia of martzburg a little shuddering breath stirred her parted lips she looked to right and left saw nothing but the enclosing forest and turned her frightened eyes on dirk i know some little magic he continued shall i show you the man you wish to make lord of martzburg there is no one she said feebly you lie he answered as i could prove as you cannot prove she returned clasping her hands together 
"'Why did your steward come with ye to Frankfurt?' answered Dirk. "'And his wife stay as Chatelaine of Martzburg. "'It had been more fitting had he remained. "'What reward will he receive for his service as your henchman at court?' "'What reward do you imagine I should offer?' she answered very slowly. "'I cannot tell,' said Dirk, with a hot force behind every word, "'for I do not know if you are a fool or no. "'But this I know. The man waits a word from you.' "'Stop,' said Jacobia. But Dirk continued ruthlessly. "'He waits, I tell you.' "'Oh, God, for what?' she cried. "'For you to say.' You think me fair, Sebastian. You know me rich, and all my life shall prove me loving, and only a red-browed woman in Martzburg Castle prevents you coming from my footstool to my side. Said you that he would take horse to-morrow for Martzburg and return a free man. The handkerchief fell from Jacobia's fingers and fluttered on the dark ferns. You are a fiend, she said in a sick voice. You cannot be human to so touch my heart, and you are wrong. I dare tell you in the name of God that you are wrong. Those evil thoughts have never come to me. In the name of the devil, I am right, smiled Dirk. The devil? Ye are one of his agents, she cried in a trembling defiance. Or how could you guess what I scarcely knew until ye came that baleful night? what he never knew till then. Ah, I swear it, he never dreamt that I, never dreamt what my favor meant, but now, his eyes, I cannot mistake them. He is a dutiful servant, said Dirk. He waits for his mistress to speak. Jacobia sank to her knees on the grass. I entreat you to forbear, she whispered. Whoever you are, Whatever your object, I ask your mercy. I am very unhappy. Do not goad me. Drive me further. Dirk stepped forward and caught her drooping shoulders in his firm hands. Pious fool, he cried. How long do you think you can endure this? How long do you think he will remain the servant when he knows he might be the master? She averted her agonized face. Then it was from you he learnt it. You! Dirk interrupted hotly. He knows, remember that. He knows, and he waits. Already he hates the woman who keeps him dumb. It were very easily done. One look, some few words. Ye would not find him slow of understanding. He loosened his grasp on her, and Jacobia fell forward and clasped his feet. I implore you, take back this wickedness. I am weak. Since my first sight of you, I have been striving against your influence that is killing me. Man or demon, I beseech you, let me be. She raised her face, the slow, bitter tears forced out of her sweet, worn eyes. Her hair fell like golden embroidery over the yellow gown, and her fingers fluttered on her unhappy bosom. Dirk considered her, curiously and coldly. I am neither man nor demon, he said, but this I tell you. As surely as he is more to you than your own soul, so surely you are lost. Lost, lost, she repeated, and half raised herself. Certes, therefore get the price of your soul, he mocked. What is the woman to you? A cold-hearted jade, as good dead now as fifty years hence? What is one sin the more? I tell you, while you set that man's image up in your heart before that of God, ye are lost already. He stepped back and clapped his hands. I promised you a sight of your lover, he said. Now let him speak for himself. Jacobia turned her head sharply. A few feet away from her stood Sebastian, holding back the heavy boughs and looking at her. She gave a shriek and rose swiftly. Dirk and the witch had disappeared. If they had slipped into the undergrowth and were yet near, 
they gave no answer when she wildly called to them the vast forest seemed utterly empty save for the silent figure of sebastian not doubting now that dirk was some evil being whom her own wicked thoughts had evoked believing that the appearance of her steward was some phantom sent for her undoing she unfortunate distracted with misery and terror turned with a shuddering relief to the oblivion of the still pool hastening with trembling feet through the clinging weeds and ferns she climbed down the damp bank and would have cast herself into the dull water when she heard his voice calling her a human voice she paused lending a fearful ear to the sound while the water rippled from her foot it is i he called my lady it is i this was sebastian himself no delusion nor ghost but her living steward as she had seen him this morning in his brown riding habit wearing her gold and blue colors round his hat she mastered her terror and confusion indeed you frightened me a lie rose to save her i thought it some robber i did not know you i have been searching for you said sebastian we came upon your horse on the high road and then upon your gloves in the grass so as no rider could come among these trees on foot i sought for you i am glad that you are safe this calm and carefully ordered speech gave her time to gather courage she fumbled at her bosom drew forth a crucifix and clutched it to her lips with a murmur of passionate prayers he could not but notice this he must perceive her soiled torn dress her wild face her white exhaustion but he gave no sign of it it was a fortunate chance that sent me here he said gravely the wood is so vast eh so vast she answered know you the way out sebastian have you met no one he asked she hesitated if he had encountered neither the woman nor the young man then they were indeed wizards or of some unearthly race she could not bring herself to speak of them no she answered at length she gathered up her long skirt and shook off the withered leaves that clung to it will you lead the way she said he turned and moved ahead of her down the narrow path by which he had come as she followed him she heard his foot fall soft on the thick grass and the swishing sound of the straying boughs as he held them back for her to pass till she found the silence so unendurable that she nerved herself to break it but several times she gathered her strength in vain for the effort and when at last some foolish words had come to her lips he suddenly looked back over his shoulder and checked her speech tis strange that your horse should have gone mad in such a manner he said but he found him she faltered ay a man found him exhausted and trembling like a thing bewitched her heart gave a great leap had he used that word by chance ye were not hurt my lady when ye were thrown said the steward no said jacobia no silence again no bird nor butterfly disturbed the sombre stillness of the wood no breeze stirred the thick leaves that surrounded them gradually the path widened until it brought them into a great space grown with ferns and overarched with trees then sebastian paused ye must rest certes it is folly to persist he added with some authority she seated herself lifting the hand that held the crucifix to her bosom gazing down into the clusters of ferns at his feet he spoke i think i must return to martzburg he said she braced herself making a gesture with her hand as if she would ward off his words you know that you are free to do what you will sebastian is it not better that i should go he challenged her with a full sideways glance i do not know 
she said desperately, why you put this to me here and now. I do not often see you alone. She opened her hand to stare down at the crucifix in her palm. You can leave Frankfurt when you wish. Why not? she said. He faced her quickly. But I may come back? It seemed to Jacobia that he echoed Dirk's words. The crucifix slipped through her trembling fingers on to the grass. What do you mean? Oh, Sebastian, what do you mean? The words were forced from her, but uttered under her breath. She added instantly in a more courageous voice, Go and come as you list. Are you not free? He saw the crucifix at her feet and picked it up. But she drew back as he came near and held out her hand. He put the crucifix into it, frowning, his eyes dark and bright with excitement. Do you recall the two students who were housed that night in Martzburg? he asked. Yes, she said. Is not one now at court? I would mean the other, the boy, answered Sebastian. She averted her face and drooped until the ends of her hair touched her knees. I met him again today, continued the steward, with a curious lift in his voice, here in this forest while searching for you. He spoke to me. Certainly the devil was enmeshing her. Surely he had brought her to this pass, sent Sebastian of all men to find her in her weariness and loneliness. And Sebastian knew, knew also that she knew. Outspoken words between them could be hardly more intolerable shame than this. He is cunning beyond most, said the steward. Jacobia lifted her head. He is an enchanter, a wizard. Do not listen to him. Do not speak to him. As you value your soul, Sebastian, do not think of him. As I value some other things, he answered grimly, I must both listen to him and consider what he says. She rose. We will go our way. I cannot talk with you now, Sebastian. But he stood in her path. Let me journey to Martzburg, he said thickly. One word. I shall understand you. She glanced and saw him extraordinarily keen and moved. He was lord of Martzburg. Could he but get her to pledge herself? In his eagerness, however, he forgot advice. Tell her, said Dirk, you have adored her for years in secret. This escaped his keenness, for though his wife was nothing to him compared with his ambition, he had no tenderness for Jacobia. Had he remembered to feign it, he might have triumphed, and now, but though her gentle heart believed he held her dear, that he did not say so made firmness possible for her. You shall stay in Frankfurt, she said with sudden strength. Sibylla asks my return, he said, gazing at her passionately. Do we not understand each other without words? The fiend has bewitched you also, she answered fearfully. You know too much, you guess too much, and yet I tell you nothing, and I... I also am bewitched, for I cannot reply to you as I should. I have been silent long, he said, but I have dared to think, had I been free, as I can be free. The crucifix was forgotten in her hand. We do evil to talk like this, she said, half fainting. You will bid me go to Martzburg, he insisted, and took her long, cold fingers. She raised her eyes to the boughs above her. No, no. Then, God, have compassion on me, she said. The thick foliage stirred. Jacobia felt as if the bars of a cage were being broken about her. She turned her head, and a little color flushed her cheek. Through the silvery stems of the larches came some knights and a page boy, members of the party left to search for her. She moved towards them. She hailed them almost gaily. None, save Sebastian, saw her as they turned towards Frankfurt, raise the crucifix, and press her lips to it. End of section 13
Recording by Molly Craig. Section 14 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 14, The Snaring of Thierry. Dirk and the witch kept company until they reached the gates of Frankfurt. There the young man took his own way through the busy town, and Natalie slipped aside into the more retired streets. Many of the passers-by saluted Dirk. Some halted to speak with him, the brilliant young doctor of rhetoric, with a reputation made fascinating by an air of mystery, was a desired acquaintance among the people of Frankfurt. He returned their greetings pleasantly, yet absently. He was thinking of Jacobia of Martzburg, whom he had left behind in the great forest, and considering what chances there might be, either for Thierry or Sibylla, the steward's wife. He passed the tall red front of the college, where the quiet trees tapped their leaves against the arched windows, turned over the narrow curved bridge that spanned the steadily flowing water of the main, and came to the thick walls surrounding the emperor's castle. There, for a moment, he paused, and looked thoughtfully up at the imperial flag that fluttered softly against the evening sky. When he passed on, it was with a cheerful step and a whistling little tune under his breath. A few moments brought him to the long street where the witch lived, a few more to her gate, and then his face lit and changed wonderfully, for ahead of him was Thierry. Flushed and panting, he ran to his friend's side, and touched him on the arm. Thierry turned, his hand on the latch, his greeting was hurried, half shamefaced. "'My master and most of the court were at the tourney to-day,' he said. "'I thought it safe to come.' Dirk withdrew his hand, and his eyes narrowed. "'Ah, ye are beginning to be circumspect how ye visit here.' "'You word it unkindly,' answered Thierry hastily. "'Let us enter the house where we can talk at ease.' They passed into the witch's dwelling, and to the room at the back that looked into the garden of red roses. The windows were set wide, and the scented softness of the evening filled the half-darkened chamber. Dirk lit a little lamp that had a green glass, and by the faint flame of it gazed long and lingeringly at Thierry. He found his friend richly dressed in black and crimson, wearing an enamel chain round his bonnet, and a laced shirt showing at his bosom. He found the glowing bright charm of his face disturbed by some embarrassment or confusion, the beautiful mouth uneasily set, the level brows slightly frowning. "'O oh, Thierry!' he cried in a half-mournful yearning. "'Come back to me! Come back!' I am very well at court, was the quick answer. My master is gentle, and my task's easy. Very clearly can I see ye are well, and very well at court. Seldom do you leave it. I find it difficult to get here often, said Thierry. Ye find it difficult, said Dirk, because your desires chain you to the court. I think ye are a faithless friend. That am not I. Ye know more of me than any man. I care more for ye than for any man. Or woman, added Dirk dryly. An impatient color came into Thierry's cheeks. He looked resolutely at the red roses. That is unworthy in you, Dirk. Is it disloyal to you to know a lady? To, to admire a lady? To strive to serve and please a lady? He turned his charming face, and in his effort to conciliate, his voice was gentle and winning. Truly, she is the sweetest of her kind, Dirk. If you knew her, evil is abashed before her. Then it is as well I do not know her, Dirk retorted grimly. Strangely ye talk. You and I know we are not saints, but belike ye would reform. Be like a second time ye have repented. Thierry seemed in some agitation. No, no, 
have I gone too far? Do I not still hope to gain something, perhaps everything? He paused, then added in a low voice, But I wish I had never laid hands on the monk. I wish I had not touched God his money. And when I see her, I cannot prevent my heart from smarting at the thought of what I am. How often do you see her? asked Dirk quietly. But seldom, answered Thierry sadly. And it is better. What could I ever be to her? Dirk smiled somberly. That is true. Yet you would waste your life dallying round the places where you may sometimes see her face. Thierry bit his lip. Oh, you think me a fool. To falter, to regret. But what have my sins ever done for me? There are many honest men better placed than I, and without the prospect of hell to blast their souls. Dirk looked at him with lowering eyes. You had been content had you not met this lady. Enough of her, answered Thierry wearily. You make too much of it. I do not think I love her, but one who is fallen must view such sweetness, such gentle purity, with sorrow, yea, with yearning. Maybe she is neither so pure nor so gentle as you think. Certes, she is as but other women as one day ye may see. Thierry turned from the window half in protest, half in excuse. Cannot you understand how one may hold a fair thing dear? How one might worship, even love? Yes, answered Dirk, and his great eyes were bright and misty. But if I loved, he spoke the word beautifully and rose as he uttered it, I would so grapple his, her soul to mine, that we should be together to all eternity. Nor devil, nor angel should divide us. But, but there is no need to talk of that. There are other matters to deal with. Would I had never seen the evil books, or never seen her face, said Thierry restlessly. So at least I had been undivided in my thoughts. He came to the table and looked at Dirk across the sickly, struggling flame of the lamp. In his hazel eyes was an expression of appeal, the call of the weak to the strong, and the other held out his hands impulsively. Ah! I am a fool to trouble with ye, my friend, he said, and his voice broke with tenderness. For ye are headstrong and unstable, and care not for me one jot. I warrant me, yet, yet you may do what you will with this silly heart of mine. There was a grace, a wistful affection in his face, in his words, in his gesture of outstretched hands, that instantly moved Thierry, ever quick to respond. He took the young doctor's slender fingers in a warm clasp. They were very quickly withdrawn. Dirk had a notable dislike to a touch, but his deep eyes smiled. I have somewhat to tell you, he said, at which your impatience will be pleased. He went lightly to a press in the wall and brought forth a mighty candlestick of red copper, branched and engraved. Three half-burnt candles remained in the sockets. He lit these, and the room was filled with a brighter and pleasanter light. Setting the candlestick on the table where it glowed over Thierry's splendid presence, he returned to the cupboard and took out a tall bottle of yellow wine and two glasses with milk-white lines round the rims. Thierry seated himself at the table, pulled off his gloves, and smoothed his hair back from his face. "'Have you seen the Empress?' asked Dirk, pouring out the wine. "'Yea,' answered Thierry, without interest. "'She is very beautiful?' "'Certes, but of a cloying sweetness. There is no touch of nobility in her.' Dirk held the wine out across the table and seated himself. "'I have heard she is ambitious,' he said. "'Ay, she gives the emperor no rest, forever urging him to Rome, 
to be crowned by the pope as emperor of the west but he better loves the north and has no spirit to rule in italy the nobles chafe at his inaction asked dirk tis not idle questioning mostly i think do we not all have golden dreams of rome balthasar ye mind him he is margrave of east flanders now since his father was killed at the boar hunt and powerful he is mad to cross the alps he has great influence with the emperor indeed i think he loves him dirk set down the untasted wine balthasar loves the emperor he cried certes yes why not the margrave was always affectionate and the emperor is lovable a second time dirk raised the glass and now drained it here is good matter for plots he said elegantly wiping his lips here is occasion for you and me to make our profit said ye the devil was a bad master listen to this thierry moved the candlestick the gold light dazzled in his eyes what can emperor or empress be to us he asked a half bewildered fear darkening his brows she has been here said dirk the lady isabel thierry stared intently a quick breath stirred his parted lips his cheeks glowed with excited color she knows continued dirk that i dr constantine of frankfort college and you meek secretary to her chamberlain are the two students chased from Baal University. Thierry gave a little sound of pain and drew back in the huge carved chair. So, said Dirk slowly, she has it in her power to ruin us, at least in Frankfurt. How can I hold up my head at court again? exclaimed Thierry bitterly. There is more in it than that, he answered quietly. Did she choose, he might have us burnt in the marketplace. Joris of Thuringia died of his illness that night. Oh, cried Thierry, blenching. But she will not choose, said Dirk calmly. She needs me, us. That threat is but her means of forcing obedience. She came secretly to my lectures. She had heard somewhat she discovered more thierry filled his glass she needs us he repeated falteringly cannot ye guess in what way thierry drank set down the half-emptied glass and looked at the floor with troubled eyes that evaded the other's bright eyes how can i tell he asked as if reluctant to speak at all Dirk repressed a movement of impatience. Come, you know. Shall I speak plainly? Certes, yes, answered Thierry, still with averted face. There is a man in her way. Thierry looked up now. His eyes showed pale in his flushed face. Who must die as Joris of Thuringia died? he asked. Yes. Thierry moistened his lips am i to help you are we not one inseparable the reward will be magnificent thierry put his hand to a damp brow who is the man hush whispered dirk peering through the halo of the candle flame it is the emperor her husband i will not do it dirk I do not think ye have a choice, was the cold answer. Ye gave yourself unto the devil, and unto me, and you shall serve us both. I will not do it, repeated Thierry in a shuddering voice. Dirk's eyes glimmered wrathfully. Take care how you say that. There are two already. What of the monk? I do not think you can turn back. Thierry showed a desperate face why have ye drawn me into this ye are deeper in devil's arts than i that is a strange thing to say answered dirk very pale his lips quivering 
you swore comradeship with me together we were to pursue success fame power you knew the means a you knew by whose aid we were to rise you shared with me the labors the disgrace that fell on both of us together we worked the spells that slew joris of thuringa together we stole god his gold from the monk now a eh, and now when i tell you our chance has come this is your manner of thanking me a chance to help a woman in a secret murder thierry spoke sullenly ye never thought our way would be the way of saintship ye were not so nice that time ye bound ambrose of menthon to the tree how often must you remind me of that cried thierry fiercely i had not done it but for you well say the same of this if you be weak i am strong enough for two thierry pulled at the crimson tassels on his slashed sleeves it is not that i am afraid he said flushing certes you are afraid mocked dirk afraid of god of justice maybe of man but i tell you that these things are not to us he paused lifted his eyes and lowered them again our destiny is not of our shaping we take the weapons laid to our hands and use them as we are bid life and death shall both serve us to our appointed end thierry came to the other side of the table and gazed fearfully across at him who are you he questioned softly dirk did not answer an expression of dread and despair withered all the life in his features the extraordinary look in his suddenly dimmed eyes sent a chill to thierry's heart ah he cried stepping back with manifest loathing dirk put his hand over his eyes and moaned do you hate me thierry do you hate me i i do not know he could not explain his own sudden revulsion as he saw the change in dirk's face he paced to and fro in a tumult dark had closed in upon them and now blackness lay beyond the window and the half-opened door shadows obscured the corners of the long chamber all the light the red gleam of the candles the green glow of the lamp shone over the table and the slight figure of dirk as thierry stopped to gaze at him anew dirk suddenly lowered his white hand and his eyes blinking above his long fingers held thierry in a keen glance this will make us more powerful than the empress or the emperor he said leave your thoughts of me and ponder on that he withdrew his hand and revealed lips as pale as his cheeks. "'What does that mean?' cried Thierry. "'I am distracted.' "'We shall go to Rome,' replied Dirk. There was a lulling quality of temptation in his tone. "'And you shall have your desires.' "'My desires?' echoed Thierry wildly. "'I have trod an unholy path.' pursuing the phantom of my desires do you still promise me i shall one day grasp it surely money and power and pleasure these things wait you in rome when isabeau shall have placed the imperial diadem on balthasar's brow these things and it seemed as if dirk's voice broke even jacobia of martzburg he added slowly can one win a saint by means of devilry cried thierry she is only a woman said dirk wearily but since you hesitate and falter i will absolve you from this league with me go your way serve your saint renounce your sins and see what god will give you no i cannot i will not forego even the hope of what you offer me his great eyes glittered with excitement, the hot blood darkened his cheek, and I pledged myself to you and your master. 
do not think me cowardly because i paused who is the emperor he spoke hoarsely nothing to you or to me as you say joris of thuringa died now you speak like my comrade at baal cried dirk joyfully now i see again the spirit that roused me to swear friendship with you the night we first met now i ah thierry we will be very faithful to one another will we not i have no choice swear it cried dirk i swear it said thierry dirk clasped and unclasped his hands on the table murmuring i have won him back won him back thierry spoke without turning his head what do you mean to do next i shall see the empress again answered dirk at present be very secret that is all there is no need to speak of it your absence may be noticed at the palace he said softly you must return how you can help me i will let you know where have you been to-day asked thierry did you see the court returning from the tourney the candle flames flaring with the movement cast a rich glow over dirk's pallid face no why do you ask he said i know not thierry's crimson doublet sparkled in its silk threads as his breast rose with the irregular breaths he walked heavily to the door gathering up his black mantle over his arm when may i come again he asked when you will answered dirk he entered the passage and held up the heavy candlestick so that a great circle of light was cast on the darkness ye are pledged to me whether ye come or no are ye not certes i do think so said thierry he hesitated thierry went down the passage he found the door and unlatched it a soft but powerful breath of air fluttered the candle flames almost on to dirk's face he turned back into the room and shut himself in leaving darkness behind him thierry stepped into the street and drew the latch a few stars were out but the night was cloudy he leant against the side of the house he felt excited confused impatient dirk's abrupt dismissal rankled he was half ashamed of the power exercised over him by his frail comrade half bewildered by the allurement of the reward that promised to be so near now rome splendor power jacobia of martzburg and only one stranger between him and this consummation he wondered why he had ever hesitated ever been horrified his anticipations became so brilliant that they mounted like winged spirits to the clouds catching him up with them he could scarcely breathe in the close atmosphere of excitement a thousand questions to which he might have demanded answer of dirk occurred to him and stung with impatience his elated heart on a quick impulse he turned to the door and tried the handle to his surprise he found it bolted from within he wondered both at dirk's caution and his softness of tread for he had heard no sound it was not yet late but he did not desire to attract attention by knocking full of his resolution to speak further with dirk he passed round the house and entered the garden with the object of gaining admittance by the low windows of the room where they had been conversing but the light had gone from the chamber and the windows were closed with an exclamation of impatience thierry stepped back among the rose bushes and looked up dirk's bedchamber was also in darkness black and silent the witch's dwelling showed against the still but stormy sky thierry felt a chill run to his heart where had the youth gone so instantly so silently who had noiselessly bolted door and windows then suddenly a light flashed across his vision it appeared in the window of a room built out from the house at the side 
a room that Thierry had always imagined was used as a store-place for Natalie's drugs and herbs. He did not remember that he had ever entered it or ever seen a light there before. His curiosity was stirred. Dirk had spoken of weariness. Perhaps this was the witch herself. He waited for the light to disappear, but it continued to glow, like a steady star across the darkness of the rose garden. The heavy scent of the half-seen blooms filled the gusty wind that began to arise. Great fragments of cloud sped above the dark roofline of the house. Thierry crept nearer the light. It had crossed his mind many times that Dirk and Natalie held secrets they kept from him, and the doubt had often set him raging inwardly. As well he knew the witch despised him as a useless novice in the black arts. Old suspicions returned to him as, advancing warily, he drew near the light and crouched against the wall of the house. A light curtain was pulled across the window, but carelessly, and drawn slightly awry to avoid the light set in the window seat. Thierry, holding his breath, looked in. He saw an oval room hung with Syrian tapestries of scarlet and yellow, and paved with black and white marble. The air was thick with the blue vapour of some perfume burning in a copper brazier, and lit by lamps suspended from the wall, their light glowing from behind screens of a pure pink silk. The end of the apartment was hidden by a violet velvet curtain embroidered with grapes and swans. Near this a low couch covered with scarlet draperies and purple cushions was placed, and close to this a table set with a white cloth bearing moons and stars worked in blue. Thierry almost betrayed himself by a cry of surprise. A long, slender woman's hand and arm slipped between the folds of the velvet. A delicate foot appeared. The curtain trembled. The aperture widened, and the figure of a girl was revealed in dusky shadow. She was tall, and wore a long robe of yellow sendal that she held up over her bosom with her left hand. She might have just come forth from the bath, for her shoulders, arms, and feet were bare, and the lines of her limbs noticeable through the thin silk. Her head and face were wrapped in a silver gauze. She stood quite still, half withdrawn behind the curtain, only the finely shaped white arm that held it back fully revealed. Her appearance impressed Thierry with unnameable dread and terror. He remained rigid at the window, gazing at her, not able, if he would, to fly. Through the veil that concealed her face, he could see restless dark eyes and the line of dark hair. He thought that she must see him, that she looked at him even as he looked at her, but he could not stir. Slowly she came forward into the room. Her feet were noiseless on the stone floor, but as she moved Thierry heard a curious dragging sound he could not explain. She was drawing nearer the window. As she approached, she half turned, and Thierry saw flat, green, and dull wings of wrinkled skin folded on her back. The tips of them touched the floor. These had made the dragging sound he had heard. With a tortured cry wrung from him, he flung up his hands to shut out the dreadful thing. She heard him, stopped, and gave a shriek of dread and anguish. The lights were instantly extinguished. The room was in absolute darkness. Thierry turned and rushed across the garden. He thought the rose bushes catching on his garments were hands seeking to detain him. He thought that he heard a window open and a flapping of wings in the air above him. He cried out to the god on whom he had turned his back, Christus, have mercy! And so he stumbled to the gate and out into the quiet street of Frankfurt. End of section 14. Recording by Molly Craig.
Section 15 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 15, Melchor of Brabant. The last chant of the monks died away. The Sabbath service was ended, and the court rose from its place in the emperor's chapel. But Jacobia remained on her knees and tried to pray. The empress, very fair and childishly sweet, drooping under the weight of her jeweled garments, even with three pages to lift her train, raised her brows to see her lady remaining, and gave her a little smile as she passed. The emperor, dark, reserved, devout, and plainly habited, followed with his eyes still on his breviary. He was leaning on the arm of Balthasar of Courtreg. The sun, falling slantwise through the high-colored windows, made the fair locks and golden clothes of the Margrave one glitter in a dazzling brightness. Jacobia could not bring her thoughts to dwell on holy things. Her hands were clasped on her prie dieu. Her open book was before her, but her eyes wandered from the altar to the crowd passing down the aisle. Among the faces that went by, she could not but mark the beautiful countenance of Thierry, the secretary to the Queen's Chamberlain. She noticed him, as she always did, for his obvious calm handsomeness. Today she noticed further that he looked grieved, distraught, and pale. Wondering at this, she observed him so intently that his long hazel eyes glanced aside and met hers in an intense gaze, grave and sad. She thought there was a question or an appeal, some meaning in his look, and she turned her slender neck and stared after him, so that two ladies following smiled at each other. Thierry kept his eyes fixed on her, until he left the chapel, and a slow color crept into his cheek. When the last courtier had glittered away out of the low arched door, Jacobia bent her head and rested her cheek against the top of the high prie dieu. Could her prayers have been shaped into words, they would have been such as these. O Mary, Empress of Heaven! O saints and angels, defend me from the devil and my own wicked heart. Shelter me in my weakness and arm me to victory. Incense still lingered in the air. It stole pleasantly to her nostrils. She raised her eyes timidly to the red light on the altar, then rose from her knees, clasping her breviary to her bosom, and turning, she saw Thierry standing inside the door watching her. She knew that he was waiting to speak to her, and she knew not why it gave her a sense of comfort and pleasure. Slowly she came down the aisle towards him, and as she approached, smiled. He took a step into the church. There was no answering smile on his face. "'Teach me to pray, I beseech you,' he said ardently. "'Let me kneel beside you.' "'I?' Alas, she answered, you do not know me. I know that if any one could lead a soul upwards, it would be you. Scarcely can I pray for myself, she answered. I am weak, unhappy, and alone. Sir, whatever your trouble, you must not come to me for aid. His dark eyes flashed softly. You, unhappy? I have ever thought of you as gay and careless as the roses. She gazed on him wistfully. Once I was. That day I saw you first. Do you remember, sir? I often recall it, because it seemed that after that I changed. She shuddered, and her gray eyes grew wet and mournful. It was your friend. Thierry's face hardened. My friend? The young scholar, she said quickly and fearfully, he, he is in Frankfurt now. You have seen him? She bowed her head. What does he want with me? He will not let me be in peace. He pursues me with horrible thoughts. He hates me. 
he will undo my soul when did you meet him asked thierry in a low fearful voice jacobia told him of the encounter in the forest he marked that it was the day of the great tourney the day when he had last seen dirk he remembered certain matters he had uttered concerning jacobia if he has been tampering with you he cried wrathfully if he dares then you know somewhat of him she interrupted in a half horror a to my shame i do he answered i know him for what he is if you value your peace your soul do not heed him she drew away but you you are, are you in league with him thierry groaned and set his teeth he holds me in a mesh of temptation he lures me into great wickedness jacobia moved still further back shrinking from him into the gloom of the chapel oh she said who who is he thierry lowered his eyes and frowned you must not ask me he fingered the base of the pilaster against the door but he troubles me she answered intensely the thought of him is like some one clinging to my garments to drag me down thierry lifted his head sharply to gaze at her tall slender figure but lifted his eyes no higher than her clasped hands that lay over the breviary below her heart how can he or such as he disturb you what temptation can you be beguiled with and as he saw the delicate fingers tremble on the ivory cover his soul was hot and sore against dirk i will not speak of what might beguile me said jacobia in a low voice i dare not speak of it let it go it is a great sin there is sin for me also murmured thierry but the prize seems almost worth it worth it you say she whispered worth it her tone made him wince he could fancy dirk at her shoulder prompting her and he lifted his head and answered strongly you cannot care to know and i dare not tell what has put me in the power of this young scholar nor what are the temptations with which he enmeshes me but this you must hear his hand was outspread on his bosom pressing on his heart his hazel eyes were dilated and intense this i should be his utterly wholly his one with him in evil if it were not for you and the thought of you you are the chatelaine of martzburg continued thierry in a less steady voice and you do not know me it is not fit that you should but twice you have been gentle with me and if and if you could so care for your sake i would shake the clinging devils off i would live good and humble and scorned the tempting youth what must i do to help you answered jacobia be what you are that is all be noble pure ah sweet that seeing you i can still believe in heaven and strive for it she looked at him earnestly why you are the only one to care that i should be noble and sweet and it would make a difference to you her questioning voice fell wistfully ah sir were you to hear a wicked thing of me and know it true did i become a vile a hideous creature would it make a difference it would for me make the difference between hell and paradise she flushed and trembled certes you have heartened me nay you must not set me in a shrine but but oh sir honour me and i will be worthy of it she raised an appealing face on my knees answered thierry earnestly i will do you worship i am no knight to wear your colours boldly but you shall win a fairer triumph than ever graced the jousts 
for I will come back to God through you, and live my days a repentant man, because of you. Nay, each through the other, said Jacobia. I think I too had, ah, Hesu, fallen, if someone had not cared. He paled with pain. What did he, that youth, tempt you with? No matter, she said faintly. It is over now. I will be equal to your thoughts of me, sir. I have no night, nor have wished for one, but I will often think of you who have encouraged me in this my loneliness. Please God, he said, we both are free of devilry. Will you make that a pact with me, that I may think of you as far above it all as is the moon above the mire? Will you give me leave to think you always as innocent as I would have my saint? Your worship, sir, shall make me so, she answered gravely. Think no ill of me, and I will do no ill. He went on his knee and kissed the hem of her soft gown. You have saved me, he whispered, from everlasting doom. As he rose, Jacobia held out her hand and touched him gently on the sleeve. God be thanked, she said. He bent his head and left her. She drew from her bosom the crucifix that had been her companion in the forest and kissed it reverently, her heart more at ease than since the day when she first met Dirk Renswode. Returning to the great hall of the palace with quick resolve to return to Martzburg or to send for Sibylla forming in her mind, she encountered the empress walking up and down the long chamber discontentedly. Isabeau, who affected a fondness for Jacobia, smiled on her indolently. But Jacobia, always a little overawed by her great loveliness, and, in her soul, disliking her, would have passed on. The empress raised her hand. Nay, stay and talk to your poor deserted lady, she said in her babyish voice. The emperor is in his chamber writing Latin prayers on a day like this. She kissed her hand to the sunshine and the flowers seen through the window. My dames are all abroad with their gallants, and I hazard what I have been doing. She held her left hand behind her and laughed in Jacobia's face. Seen thus in her over-gorgeous clothes, her childlike appearance and beauty giving her an air of fresh innocence, she was not unlike the little image of the Virgin often set above her altars. Guess, she cried again, then without waiting for an answer, catching butterflies in the garden. She showed her hand now, and held delicately before Jacobia's eyes a white net drawn tightly together full of very colored butterflies. What is the use of them, poor souls? asked Jacobia. The empress looked at her prisoners. Their wings are very lovely, she said greedily. If I pulled them off, would they last? Sewn on silk, how they would shimmer. Nay, they would fade, answered Jacobia hastily. Ye have tried it? demanded the empress. Nay, I could not be so cruel. I love such little gay creatures. Reflection darkened Isabeau's gorgeous eyes. Well, I will take the wings off and see if they lose their brightness. She surveyed the fluttering victims. Some are purple, a rare shade. Jacobia's smooth brow gathered in a frown of distress. They are alive, she said, and it is agreeable to them to live. Will you not let them free? Isabeau laughed, not at all babyish now. You need not watch me, dame. Your grace does not consider how gentle and helpless they are. Indeed, Jacobia flushed in her eagerness. They have faces and little velvet jackets on their bodies. Isabeau frowned and turned away. 
"'It amuses you to thwart my pleasures,' she answered. She suddenly flung the net at Jacobia. "'Take them and be gone!' The Chatelaine of Martzburg, knowing something of the Empress, was surprised at this sudden yielding. Looking round, however, she learned the cause of it. The Margrave of East Flanders had entered the hall. She caught up the rescued butterflies and left the chamber, while the empress sank into the window seat among the crimson cushions patterned with sprawling lions, pulled a white rose out of her belt, and set her teeth in the stem of it. "'Where is Malquire? asked the margrave, coming towards her. His immense size, augmented by his full, rich clothes, gave him the air of a golden giant." writing latin prayers she mocked were you emperor of the west lord balthasar would you do that he frowned i am not such a holy man as malquire isabeau laughed were you my husband would you do that his fresh fair face flushed rose color this is among the things i may not even fancy she looked out of the window her dress was low and loosened about the shoulders, by cause of the heat, she said, but she loved to make a pageant of her beauty. Purposely she was silent, hoping Balthasar would speak, but he stood, without a word, leaning against the tapestry. Oh, God, she said at last, without turning her head, I loathe Frankfurt. His eyes glittered, but he made no answer. Were I a man, I would not be so tame. Now he spoke. Princess, you know that I am sick for Rome, but what may we do when the emperor makes delays? Melchior should be a monk, his wife returned bitterly, since a German township serves him when he might rule half the world. Now she gave Balthasar her lovely face and fixed on him her violet eyes. We of the East do not understand this diffidence. My father was an Agian groom who took the throne by strangling the life out of his master. He ruled strongly in Ravenna. I was born in the purple, nursed in the gold. I do not fathom your northern tardiness. The emperor will go to Rome, said the margrave in a troubled voice. He will cross the Alps this year, I think. Her white lids drooped. You love Malquire, therefore you bear with him. He lifted his head. You, too, must bear with him, since he is your lord, princess, he answered. How stern you are, Margrave, if I but turn a breath against Malquire, and sometimes you wrong me, forgetting that I also am your friend. Her eyes were quick to flash over him, to mark how stiffly and awkwardly he stood and could not look at her. My duty to the emperor, she said softly, and my love cannot blind me to his weakness now. Come, Lord Balthasar, to you also it is weakness. Even your loyalty must admit we lose the time. The Pope says, come. The king of the Lombards will acknowledge my lord, his suzerain, and here we stay in Frankfurt, waiting for the winter to cut off the Alps. Certes, he is wrong, frowned the margrave. Wrong. If I were he, I would be emperor in good sooth, and all the world should know that I ruled in Rome. She drew a long breath. Strange that we, his friend and his wife, cannot persuade him. The nobles are on our side also. Save Hugh of Rousselary, who is ever at his ear, answered Balthasar. He brings him to stay in Germany. The Lord of Rousselary, echoed the Empress. His daughter was your wife? I never saw her, he interrupted quickly, and she died. Her father seems, therefore, to hate me. And me also, I think, though why I do not know, she smiled. His daughter's dead. Dead? Oh, we are very sure that she is dead. 
Certes, she was as good as another, the Margrave spoke gloomily. Now I must wed again. The Empress stared at him. I did not think you considered that. I must. I am the Margrave now. Isabeau turned her head and fixed her eyes on the palace garden. There is no lady worthy of your rank, and at the same time free, she said. You have an heiress in your train, princess, Jacobia of Martzburg. I have thought of her. Can you think of her? She is near as tall as you, Margrave, and not fair. Oh, a gentle fool enough, but, but, she looked over her shoulder. Am I not your lady? Ay, and ever will be, he answered, lifting his bright blue eyes. I wear your favor. I do battle for you. In the jousts you are my queen of love. I make my prayers in your name and am your servant, princess. Well, you need not a wife. She bit her lips to keep them still. Certes, answered Balthasar wonderingly, a knight must have a wife besides a lady, since his lady is oft times the spouse of another, and his highest thought is to touch her gown. But a wife is to keep his castle and do his service. The empress twisted her fingers in and out her girdle. I had rather, she cried passionately, be wife than lady. Ye are both, he answered flushing, the emperor's wife and my lady. She gave him a curious glance. Sometimes I think you are a fool, yet maybe it is only that I am not used to the north. How you would show in Byzantium, my cold margrave and she leant across the gold and red cushions towards him. Certes, you shall have your long straight maiden. I think her heart is as chill as yours. He moved away from her. Ye shall not mock me, princess, he said fiercely. My heart is hot enough. Let me be. She laughed at him. Are you afraid of me? Why do you move away? Come back, and I will recount you the praises of Jacobia of Mardsburg. He gave her a sullen look. No more of her. And yet your heart is hot enough. Not with the thought of her. God knows. But the empress pressed her hands together and slowly rose, looking past Balthasar at the door. Melchior, we speak of you, she said. The margrave turned. The emperor, velvet shod, was softly entering. He glanced gravely at his wife and smilingly at Balthasar. We speak of you, repeated Isabeau, dark-eyed and flushed, of you and Rome. Melchior of Brabant, third of his name, austere, reserved, proud, and cold, looked more like a knight of the church than king of Germany and emperor of the West. He was plainly habited, his dark hair cut close, his handsome, slightly haughty face composed and stern. Too earnest was he to be showily attractive, yet many men adored him, among them Balthasar of Courtrai, for in himself the emperor was both brave and lovable. Cannot you have done with Rome, he asked sadly, while his large, intelligent eyes rested affectionately on the margrave. Is Frankfurt grown so distasteful? Certes, no, Lord Melchior. It is the chance, the chance. The emperor sank in a weary manner on to a seat. Hugh of Rousselary and I have spoken together, and we have agreed, Balthasar not to go to Rome. The empress stiffened and dropped her lids. The margrave turned swiftly to face his master, and all the color was dashed out of his fresh face. Melchior smiled gently. My friend, ye are an adventurer, and think of the glory to be gained. But I must think of my people, who need me here. The land is not fit to leave." It will need many men to hold Rome. We must drain the land of knights. 
wring money from the poor tax the churches leave germany defenceless a prey to the franks and this for the empty title of emperor balthasar's breast heaved is this your decision the emperor answered gravely i do not think it god his wish that i should go to rome the margrave bent his head and was silent but isabeau flung her clear voice into the pause in constantinople a man such as you would not long fill a throne ere now you had been a blinded monk and i free to choose another husband the emperor rose from his seat the woman raves he said to the pale margrave begone balthasar the german left them when his heavy footfall had died into silence melchoir looked at his wife and his eyes flashed god forgive my father he said bitterly for tying me to this eastern she-cat i was meant for a man's mate she cried fiercely for a caesar's wife i would they had flung me to a footboy sooner than given me to thee thou trembling woman's soul thou hast repaid the injury answered the emperor sternly by the great unhappiness i have in thee my life is not sweet with thee nor easy i would thou hast less beauty and more gentleness i am gentle enough when i choose she mocked balthasar and the court think me a loving wife it is most true none save i know you for the thing you are heartless cruel fierce and hard she came swiftly across the floor to him have you any courage any blood in you will you go to rome to please your wanton ambition i will do nothing nor will i for any reason go to rome isabeau quivered like an infuriated animal i will talk no more of it said melchoir coldly and wearily too often do we waste ourselves in such words as these i am ashamed to call you lord she said hoarsely humbled before every woman in the kingdom who sees her husband brave at least while i know you coward hark to me my wife i am your master and the master of this land i will not be insulted nay nor flouted by your stinging tongue hold me in what contempt ye will you shall not voice it by st george no not if i have to take the whip to hold you dumb ho oh, a christian knight she jeered i loathe your church as i loathe you i am not isabeau but still morosia porfiroginita do not remind me thy father was a stableman and a murderer said melchoir nor that i caused thee to change a name the woman of thy line had made accursed would i could send thee back to ravenna for thou hast brought me naught but bitterness be careful breathed isabeau be careful stand out of my way he commanded for answer she loosened the heavy girdle round her waist he saw her purpose and caught her hands you shall not strike me the links of gold hung from her helpless fingers while she gazed at him with brilliant eyes would you have struck me yea across your mouth she answered now were you a man you would kill me he took the belt from her arm releasing her that you should trouble me he said wearily at this she stood aside to let him pass he turned to the door and as he lifted the tapestry flung down her belt the empress crept along the floor snatched it up and stood still panting before the passion had left her face the hangings were stirred again one of her chamberlains princess there is a young doctor below desires to see you constantine his name of frankfort college oh said isabeau a guilty color touched her whitened cheek i know nothing of him she added quickly pardon princess he says tis to decipher an old writing you have sent to him his words are when you see him you will remember 
the blood burnt more brightly still under the exquisite skin bring him here she said but even as the chamberlain moved aside the slender figure of dirk appeared in the doorway he looked at her smiling calmly his scholar's cap in his hand do you remember me he asked the empress moved her head in assent end of section 15 recording by molly craig section 16 of black magic by marjorie bowen this librivox recording is in the public domain part 1 chapter 16 the quarrel dirk ranswode laid down the pen and pushed aside the parchment and lifted heavy eyes with a sigh of weariness it was midday and very hot the witch's red roses were beginning to shed their petals and disclose their yellow hearts and the leaves of the great trees that shaded the house were curling and yellowing in the fierce sun from his place at the table dirk could mark these signs of autumn without yet by the look in his eyes it seemed that he saw neither trees nor flowers but only some image evoked by his thoughts presently he picked up the quill bit the end of it frowned and laid it down then he started and looked round with some eagerness for a light sound broke the sleepy stillness the door opened and before his expectant gaze thierry appeared dirk flushed and smiled well met he said i have much to say to you and i am come because i also have much to say speak then he returned to his seat took his face between his two delicate hands and rested his elbows on the table i was writing my lecture for to-night certes i shall be glad of a diversion there is no need to make an ado thierry began obviously with an effort i am not going on with you you are not going on repeated dirk well your reasons may god forgive me what i have done cried thierry in great agitation but i will sin no more i have resolved it and ye cannot tempt me and all you swore to me demanded dirk his eyes narrowed but he remained composed no man is bound to bargains with the devil i have been weak and wicked but i mingle no more in your fiendish counsels this is for jacobia of bardsburg's sake it is for her sake because of her that i am here now to tell you i have done with it done with you dirk dropped his hands on to the table thierry thierry he cried wildly and sorrowfully i have measured the temptation said thierry i have thought of the gain the loss i have put it aside with god's help and hers i will not aid you in the way you asked me nor will i see it done and ye call that virtue cried dirk poor fool all it amounts to is that you alas love the chatelaine nay he answered hotly it is that having seen her i would not be vile you meditate a dastard thing the emperor is a noble knight ambrose of menthon was a holy monk retorted dirk who choked the pious words in his throat joris of thuringa was an innocent youth who sent him to a hideous death ay cried thierry fiercely but always with you to goad me on before the devil sent you across my way i had never touched sin save in dim thoughts but you with talk of friendship lured me from an honest man's company to poison me with forbidden knowledge to tempt me into hideous blasphemies and i will have no more of it yet you vowed comradeship with me said dirk is your loyalty of such quality thierry sprang violently from his chair and paced heavily up and down the room you blinded me i knew not what i did 
but now i know when i heard her speak and heard that you had dared to try to trap her to destruction dirk interrupted with a low laugh so she told you that but i warrant that she was dumb about the nature of her temptation that is no matter answered thierry now she is free of you as i shall be as you vowed to her you would be added dirk well go your way i thought you loved me a little but the first woman's face thierry stood still to front him i cannot love that which i fear dirk went swiftly very pale do you fear me thierry he asked wistfully eh ye know too much of satan's lore more than you ever taught me he shuddered uncontrollably there are things in this very house what do you mean what do you mean dirk rose in his place who is the woman whispered thierry fearfully there is a woman here in this house there are none save natalie and me answered dirk on the defensive his eyes dark and glowing there you lie to me the last time i was here i turned back swiftly on leaving but found the door bolted the lights out all save one in the little chamber next to this i watched at the window and saw a gorgeous room and a woman a winged woman you dream answered dirk in a low voice do you think i have enough power to raise such shapes i think twas some love of yours from hell whence you came my love is not in hell but on the earth answered dirk quietly yet shall we go together into the pit as for the woman it was a dream there is no gorgeous chamber there he crossed the room and flung open a little door in the wall see old natalie's closet full of herbs and charms thierry peered into an ill-lit apartment filled with shelves containing jars and bottles the enchantment that could bring the woman could change the room he muttered unconvinced dirk gave a slow strange look was she beautiful Eh, but more beautiful than jacobia of martzburg thierry laughed i cannot compare satan's handmaiden with a lily from paradise dirk closed the closet door thierry he said falteringly do not leave me you are the only thing in all the universe can move me to joy or pain i love you utterly out on such affection that would steal my soul you do not know how dear i hold you insisted dirk in a trembling voice come back to me and i will let your lady be she can scorn ye defy ye as i do now will she certes i wonder will she he cried you will have none of me you say you reject me but for how long for ever answered thierry hoarsely or until jacobia of martzburg falls thierry swung round that leaves it still forever maybe however only for a few poor weeks your lily is very fragile thierry so look to see it broken in the mud if you harm her cried thierry fiercely if you blast her with your hellish spells nay i will not of herself she shall come to ruin when that is i will return to you so farewell for ever wait dirk called to him what of this that you know of me thierry paused so much i owe you that i should be silent since if you speak you bring to light your own history smiled dirk but about the emperor god helping me i will prevent that how will you prevent it dirk asked quietly would you betray me as a first offering to your outraged god 
Thierry pressed his hand to his brow in a bewildered, troubled manner. No, no, not that, but I will take occasion to warn him, to warn some one of the Empress. Dirk hunched his shoulders scornfully. Ah, be gone. Ye are a foolish creature. Go and put them on their guard. Thierry flushed. Ay, I will, he answered hotly. I know one honest man about the court, Hugh of Rousselary. A quick change came over Dirk's face. The Lord of Rousselary, he said. I should remember him, certes. His daughter was Balthasar's wife, Ursula. Warn whom you will, say what you will. Save, if ye can, Melchoir of Brabant. Be gone. See, I seek not to detain you. One day you shall come back to me, when yon soft saint fails, and I shall be waiting for you. Till then, farewell. Their eyes met. Thierry's were the first to falter. He muttered something like a malediction on himself, lifted the latch, and strode away. Dirk had not been long alone when the door was pushed open and Natalie crept in. The witch came to the table, took up the youth's passive hand and fawned over it. Let him go, she said in an insinuating voice. He is a fool. Why, I have put no strain on him to stay, Dirk smiled faintly. But he will return. Nay, pleaded Natalie, forget him. Forget him repeated Dirk mournfully, but I love him. Natalie stroked the still, slim fingers anxiously. This affection will be your ruin, she moaned. Dirk gazed past her at the autumn sky and the overblown red roses. Well, if it be so, he said pantingly, it will be his ruin also. He must go with me when I leave the world, the world. After all, Natalie, he turned his strange gaze on the witch, it does not matter if she hold him here so long as he is mine through eternity. His lips flushed and quivered. The long lashes drooped over his eyes. Then suddenly he smiled. Natalie, he has good intentions. He hopes to save the emperor. The witch blinked up at him. But is it too late? Certes, I conveyed the potion to Isabeau this morning, and Dirk's smile deepened. End of section sixteen. Recording by Molly Craig.